the liturgy is the engine of history. You know, Karl Marx notwithstanding, yeah, yeah. that it was never about materialism. It wasn't right, about right. who owns the means of production. It wasn't about the physical labor and the monetary power. It never was. Although back then, everybody thought it was just like they do today. Mm. So the thing to me that's, that's most interesting about Augustine positing this idea of like the city of God and you have the unique civilization building power of Christian faith is it's not building, the, it's not about building empire. That's right. It's not the Roman Empire, right? And it never was. Mm. It wasn't the Davidic Empire either. Right, right. And it becomes a heavenly reality which these things participate in some kind of sacramental fashion. Right. Right? But as soon as you, and that's my concern with so many of these projects you're talking about frustration-wise, is I think it immediately confuses that, is that what the project of Augustine became is that it becomes about a defense of like Christian monarchs or Christian kingdoms or something else. So it's like, no, I think it's really a defense of the church as the only commonwealth right. or the only republic. And these other ones can be more or less virtuous. They can be more or less just. They can participate better in the life of the church. But anytime you aggrandize the political order to such an extent that you're, right, you, you confuse those, I think there's a danger in, yeah. in confusing those two orders. It reminds me, too, of a Canadian literary analyst, Northrop Fry, who wrote a famous book some 40 years ago called The Great Code, The Bible is Literature. And one of his initial observations is that when you read scripture, you recognize great literature. He himself was not a man of faith. He probably had it once upon a time, but he lost it. But it didn't, you know, it, it didn't take away from him the ability to appreciate mm -hmm. sacred scripture. But one of his wry observations was, as you study the Old Testament, you realize that the people of God are just terrible at kingdom building. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> you look at that and you're like, these poor souls don't know how to build what the Egyptians found it effortless, you know, and the Babylonians, yeah, the yeah. Medo-Persian. year you know, dynasties all right. around them. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, you have David, Okay, king of Judah, seven years, all 12 <laughs> tribes for 33, you know, and then Solomon for 40, but he's already tanking <laughs> yeah, in the end quick. with the concubines <laughs> and the 700 wives. It's like, wow, their Camelot was barely two generations. Yeah. We freeze frame that golden age and act as though this was typical. But I think what David would whisper to us from heaven is this, that even when I was king, and even when I, I saw, the, I oversaw the smooth succession of my son Solomon to be my successor. When we were there for the coronation, when we were singing the Psalms of Ascent, when the high priest Zadok was offering the sacrifices, we were in exile. Mm. We weren't home yet. Mm. Right? And that what we're really doing, and the chronicler makes this clear, because in a dream, a vision, David gets from God the blueprint for the earthly Jerusalem mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and the man-made temple. We assume that the New Testament has foisted upon the worldliness of the old, this otherworldly picture. The Old Testament patriarchs, the prophets, the saints, had the same faith in the coming of Christ that we have in the Christ who has come. That the promise and the covenant and the liturgy, as we describe it in the book, the liturgy is the engine of history. You know, Karl Marx notwithstanding, yeah, yeah, yeah. that it was never about materialism. It wasn't right, about right. who owns the means of production. It wasn't about the physical labor and the monetary power. It never was. Although back then, everybody thought it was just like they do today. Mm. What if, you know, you mentioned before, Matt, the idea of liturgy and liberation. What if, you know, for the first 10 signs in Egypt, God just flexes his pinky and takes out the entire Egyptian pantheon? you know, beginning with the Nile and Hopi and all of the rest. And then for the tenth and final sign, the only one where the Israelites were required a modicum of obedience, mm -hmm. you have the Passover, mm -hmm. you know, sacrifice, communion, mm -hmm. and then preparedness to flee. Then you realize that the way that you were liberated from Egyptian bondage had next to nothing to do with economics or politics. It had everything to do with the liturgy of the Passover. And not only are you brought out of slavery for or by the liturgy, but you're brought to Mount Sinai, not for the constitutional convention of the 12 tribes, but for the covenant renewal of the family of God. And again, it's liturgy. When you read the legislation in Exodus, there is such a whopping disproportion. It's like mm. 75, 80 plus percent of the law is about the tabernacle, the vestments, the right. altar, the ark, yeah. the high priesthood, 
It's like that's all ritual regulation. Yeah. You know, get to the important stuff, the politics, the economics, the education. Mm. It is important, sure. only this is far more important. And so you're delivered from Egyptian bondage by the liturgy. You're delivered for the freedom that only comes yes. by abandoning the gods of Egypt and embracing the one true God. And by the time the conquest is complete, David has cracked the code. The same thing is true, not only for coming out of Egypt, but for tracing the trajectory. It wasn't to come to Mount Sinai, but Zion. It wasn't the tent that we were to build. It was the temple right. that Solomon built. And it's like, we have to rethink some things. Right. It's interesting because you, you pointed to Augustine's city of God. Right? And so Augustine's at this moment in history where things are collapsing around him. Maybe the sack of Rome, right? right the sack the of Rome, impregnable Rome. I mean, mm -hmm. which they thought was invincible, right? Invincible. And the exactly. whole, and, and, and it becomes a very long answer to a letter from his friend Marcellinus as to like, how do we explain that Rome becomes Christian and then it gets sacked, right? Becomes this kind of like that's the apologetic mm. problem he has to, and then it's a really, after this because of this, you right? know? Mm -hmm. it's yeah. because it became Christian that right. it was sacked, and it becomes an easy argument. But then what's fascinating, right, is that Augustine goes his his primary answer, and then the most neglected books of the City of God is to go very extensively through the Old Testament history. This is his answer, right? Very extensively. <laughs> right. It's the first universal theology of history. Right, and he goes through all these obscure, to, to most Catholics, obscure the, you know, the books of Kings, the books of Samuel, Chronicles, and, and you know, most people probably reading these books, they just skip. Let me get to the right. fun stuff at the end. Let's get to the politics. What, what do they do? They, they read stuff about Adam and Eve, because that's kind of cool, and the angels. Then all of a sudden, oh man, we're getting to a bunch of monarchs. Skip, now I'm in book 19, and we get to have the integralist conversation, because book 19 is where he does his definition of what a republic is. Mm -hmm. But then they miss the whole point that you only get to the definition of a republic after you've gone through this massive, quite lengthy survey of, of kingdoms. And, and what's fascinating to me is, in particular, when he gets to the divided kingdom towards the end of, of the history of the kingdoms, is he does this alternating thing where he, he, he talks about uh, a god of the pagan world, usually Assyria or Rome, and then he talks about a god that's happening at the same point in salvation history. And he just points out again and again like, all the gods of the pagans are deified. That's what they do to their kings when they die. They deify them. Right. And then what you have is you either have kings who serve right worship and they're success for the people of God, or they serve pagan worship and you fall. But it's his whole evaluation of kingdoms the whole way through, this is what I thought was fitting, his whole evaluation of kingdoms the whole way through is about worship. worship. And it's the contrast between kings who refuse the act of being made divine, right, and their humility and in their worship of only true God, and those pagan kings who are grandized and they're deified and made into divine figures. And that requires a whole instrument of statecraft that's built around myth making and the, the poetic establishment. Mm -hmm. That's good. <laughs> so, I, what, so I think of that, that is like, that's fascinating to me that that becomes the contrast. The other thing that struck me when you're talking about that is that when they're brought out of Egypt, they're actually brought into a state of exile. Exactly. Right? It's, it's like, leave your political, it's the not desert. just. Yeah. yeah, manna, you know, that <laughs> doesn't taste good. Right, right. Yeah. And so the fact that they're always like wanting the flesh pots of Egypt and they want their cucumbers and their melons back and yeah, right, right, and the leeks and all this, they have this longing for a place that they've left that, that suggests, right, that there's something of the exile feature that's necessary and that maybe part of what we have as Christians is we want to rebel against the admission of exile. Yeah. Like I see this all the time, even with my students in an analogous fashion, so my students, you, you're talking about them and you try to get through to them that there is no, as much as the mass is heaven on earth, there is no mass in heaven. Right. We don't need it. We don't need the Eucharist. Like, why would we have the Eucharist anymore? Yeah. Where's the tabernacle? When, when's the adoration, you know, yeah, 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 confession? Yeah. Like, yeah. no. No, like no that, visible that, signs. We have the reality now. Right, but it's the same ways that I think we have in certain ways, even as Catholics, like you're talking about David, he's got a blueprint. And what he builds in Jerusalem, and what he builds in the temple, what Solomon built, is a blueprint of heaven. That's right. Right, and I mean, even if you a read the scale model, right. you know, mm. a rough draft, if you will. Mm. And that's how they, the medievals all read Moses. When Moses re builds the tabernacle, all the medievals think that Moses has a miraculous vision of heaven, and the tabernacle is Moses trying to figure out how to put down a miraculous vision, right? That's right. And then you they know, read. And the, and the design yeah. that you have, you know, he had to make all things according to the pattern that was revealed to him. <laughs> the Hebrew word tabnit is actually translated in the Septuagint as tupos. Right. So the idea of typology, that this is a type, an earthly image mm. of a heavenly reality. You know, and there is a dynamic too that Aquinas plays off, that the tent, the tabernacle versus the, tab, the temple in Jerusalem. You have Sinai where the tabernacle is built for their wandering. You, in, in Jerusalem at Zion, you have the temple. Well, this is the mortal body. 
of the wayfarer, the pilgrim. Whereas this is the resurrected body. Mm -hmm. And Paul plays off of this in 2 Corinthians 2. 